So friends, welcome, welcome to our virtual talk with uh, Leduc number one, known as the Last Chance Well, and Justin from the Canadian Energy Museum. My name is Christina, and I am the Educational Program Coordinator here at the Oil Museum of Canada National Historic Site. I'll be moderating this presentation uh, for this evening, and I'm going to begin with some background information about using Zoom and the webinar format before we get started. You can use the chat box to talk with other webinar attendees or to make comments. If you want to send a message to the whole group, make sure you've selected all attendees. To get the chat started, you're welcome to share where you're watching from tonight and where you're commenting from. You can put your questions in the chat box or you can use the Q&A button to submit your questions and we will be answering them throughout the presentation or at the end, whichever is most appropriate. I'll be recording the presentation tonight and you will receive a link in an email so you can watch it and share it with your friends. It'll also be available by next week on our YouTube channel. As this is our third virtual talk, ooh, no, I think this is like our fifth or sixth virtual talk. Um, I want to introduce the museum. So the Oil Museum of Canada is a designated national historic site situated in the historic oil fields of Oil Springs located in Ontario's first designated industrial heritage district and recognized under the Ontario Heritage Act. The museum preserves and interprets the history of Lambton County's innovation and global contributions to the pioneering oil industry. This evening, I'm very pleased to welcome Justin Williams, the executive director for the Canadian Energy Museum in Alberta. Originally from Ottawa, he is has a background in history and museums, completing degrees in both subjects, letting his passions for museums lead him all across Canada. I've been hearing little tidbits from Halifax all the way out west. Justin enjoys getting to explore new areas of, care of Canada and is learning from the local peoples. When he's not entertaining the visitors up there in Calgary, you can find him playing sports, watching TV and movies and planning his next adventure. Thank you, Justin, for being with us. You are free to share your screens and tell us all about the exciting contributions that Leduc has and continuing this narrative that we love here at the Oil Museum. How did we get from the first well, which is just out front here, to the booming oil industry that is Alberta and what that pathway looks like and how did that really change who we are and who this country is? There's a lot of history there. So I'm going to turn it over to Justin, and I'm going to be quiet. It is a lot. Thank you so much for having uh, us here. We are very excited. Uh, as you can see, it's still light out. Uh, it gets uh, being up uh, close to Edmonton. You're way higher up uh, in geography-wise than Southern Ontario that, or Ottawa from what I'm used to, and most of Canada for that matter. Uh, in the winter times, you know, it gets dark. A little bit earlier but in the summer times it can be light out pretty close to midnight so it's a very unique situation it's only five o'clock here so it's still still light out it's february now which means we're on our way to spring um and i'm so excited to be uh here talking with you all about how we got to here and uh, potentially what our future is uh going forward but uh, yeah, a very exciting event happened here almost 76 years to the day. We're about a week and a half, week and a little bit away from the anniversary uh, happened. And I'll show you because I'm just like uh, Christina, I am used to being educational and very much. So I'll be going around. I'll try and make jokes, even though I can't see you. Uh, I'm sure you'll be laughing. So right on the other side of those school buses and the little garage hut there, 76 years ago today, about 200, oh, probably like 150 meters from where I'm standing inside the museum, uh, Leduc number one came into service. And that ushered in a kind of role reversal for not only Alberta, but kind of Canada in the world's market of energy. Now, of course, Canada, we have a lot of energy, a lot of different areas. I grew up using hydro. Uh, when I come out here and say the word hydro, a lot of people scratch their heads not knowing what that word means. Uh, so that's pretty much 
what the Canadian Energy Museum is trying to teach uh, the public and visitors going forward is uh, it's not just oil, even though Alberta is much known for oil, uh, it still uses things like coal to this day. Uh, there is a little bit of hydro. There is so much energy that comes from all over Canada, and we want to explore that and talk about it because we're all going to have to use all different types of energy in our future. Uh, oil's not going away. That's the number one question I get the most is, oh, if you're taking it away, you're not taking it away. Even though you might hear those buzzwords, uh, oil's too important to just completely shut it off, but we have to integrate all sorts of different energies uh, to allow us to survive and use the planet uh, properly, if you will, and uh, for it to be as healthy as possible. So we are going to kind of go through and the best way to do that is to go back in time. So we're going to go back in time. You might, uh, you know, maybe know this place that we might be talking about uh, ever so slightly. And of course, everything gets shown, but we're going to start from the beginning. So the legend of Leduc number one, or the last chance well. Well, how do we get to the last chance well that happens in 1947? Well, we have to go back to even before Canada was a country. So what's happening around this time? So uh, North America is going through a little bit of trial and tribulation. We have the War of 1812. In Canada, more specifically, or what becomes Canada, we have the Rebellion of 1837 and the reform that takes place after that. We get to a little bit of confederation become a country or a tiny bit of a country with a lot of land to the west that no one seems to know what we're going to do with. We have the Rebellion of 1885, where we're worried about the Americans invading Canada, uh, a railroads being built. Uh, we want people out here, so it makes it hard for the Americans because there's lots of resources here. There's lots of trees, lots of minerals, lots of things to be had, and we want that for our country, and we don't want the Americans to potentially take that from us. Going into the 20th century, Canada feels like a little brother compared to the rest of the world. And we want to be in the table. We want to be at the table or like Hamilton says, they want to be in the room where it happens. Uh, that is Canada feeling that little bit of little brother syndrome. Uh, world War One happens. And then we see a huge contribution uh, just all over Canada coming together and really making an impact in the world. What does that all mean? Well, we bring it back down to Canada's energy history. If we wanna get really down to it, the history goes back thousands of years. The indigenous people have been using the natural resources uh, found all over uh, North America for thousands of years to make their own versions of energy and using the earth as healing. But that's way too much history to go through in the short amount of time we have. So we're going to talk about uh, kind of the connecting parts to how we get to Leduc, uh, Canada's history and how that makes sense going forward uh, because it's still gonna be written today. The, nothing's written, nothing's finished. Uh, and we're still writing that story today and it includes all Canadians. It's not just certain people. Uh, everyone has a say in how the history and the uh, energy history is going to be written in Canada. Uh, and to be able to help us finish that story, we have to see where we've come from. So we're gonna take a little bit of, uh, little bit of time travel. I'll have everyone back, hopefully, you know, no blizzard by the time we get back, but I can't guarantee that. So my magic doesn't work quite that well. Uh, and we're going to head to Oil Springs. Imagine that, wow, what a landing spot. Uh, so in case uh, it's been a little while since you've visited uh, geography class, uh, in 1867, when Canada becomes a country, this is what Canada looks like. Uh, it is four provinces. What we know of Quebec today is about half of what it is today. Ontario, same thing, about half of what it is today. And then we have New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And then all the way to the West is Rupert's Land, uh, very much so, and it was used for fur trapping. But why oil springs? Hmm. I, 
I don't know, it was something happened there, I guess. Well, Oil Springs, as you know, was the first location of the first commercial well. Uh, it was dug to produce oil. Uh, great time to do this in 1858. Not in the 1900s, 1858. I definitely uh, did not know that we were producing that uh, way too, uh, you know, a lot earlier than you think of, uh, but energy, oil, uh, digging, using resources is a lot older than what people think it pretty much is. Now, why are we going to be doing this? Hmm, great question. Uh, well, what we're going to be looking for, there's no cars. So when people think oil, uh, we usually think, you know, cars or forming plastics, uh, using it in foods, obviously not uh, petroleum in foods, but uh, we have different uses for it. And back then we were going to make it into kerosene. I'm sure some of you have used kerosene in the past. I know I've used kerosene. Uh, does anybody save it for questions? Because I input it a little here. Kerosene is Q &A. so important. We use it all the time when we go camping. How can you go yes. camping without your kerosene lantern? Oh, kerosene is so useful. And anybody that really is flying anywhere, it's not much of a difference between kerosene and jet fuel. That is true. That's a great connecting point. Yes, kerosene, especially being out here uh, in Alberta, there's lots of national parks, lots of camping to be had. Kerosene lanterns are very, very important. And, you know, with today's technology, a little bit safer than putting fire on a stick and walking through, especially if it's been a really dry, we don't want to set fires to our national parks. Uh, so Plus, kerosene it's lanterns. much better for the whales because before kerosene, it was whale oil. So we at the oil Whale museum blubber, are yes. a little bit different than uh, Canadian Energy. We say oil saved the whales. Oh, it did. I, I'm going to have to use that. Yes, whale blubber was a very sought after commodity. Helped a little bit in the uh, kind of depopulation uh, of whales, but then also bigger ships help with that too. That's a different topic. Uh, so kerosene uh, becomes a massive product uh, at this time and oil springs becomes a hotbed for this. Uh, so we have it in our lanterns. Uh, however, within about 25 years, the major use of kerosene uh, to light the way gets taken over by, a, you know, maybe a major invention that we still use today. The reason why we light uh, all over, the light bulb comes into common use and, uh, eradicates the daily use of a currency lantern in people's houses, um, which is unfortunate. But in our time, by 1861, 400 wells had been dug out in oil springs, uh, which boomed the community, as you guys know. And it's very similar to the story of Devon. There's a lot of similarities between uh, oil springs and Devon. You're probably thinking, Devon, where's Devon? I've never heard of that. I will talk about Devon in a little bit. Uh, so don't you worry. Uh, but unfortunately, oil springs gets kind of looked over and passed off to Petrolia. And, you know, that happens. Uh, it was less than 10 years from the first commercial well uh, beginning. Uh, so things move very, very fast. Do you think things move fast now? Uh, it's very fast. It kind of always seemed that way. But with Petrolia, there was kind of renewed hope in striking it rich that, oh, we're going to find oil. There's going to be plenty of it. And we're going to make lots of money. Because, of course, that's the first thing you think of when uh, you look for resources is how much money can I make? <laughs> um, In this case, but, they made lots of money. <laughs> they made millions and money. they were able to erect one of the prettiest Victorian towns. Exactly. So money brings resources, it brings materials, it brings people, it brings stores, it brings a lot of things together. So that's the idea of we're going to build a community around this resource so that we can just make a whole big community that's going to lasts longer than we can even imagine. 
So much promise was shown in Petrolia that in 1880, a little known company called Imperial Oil was started. Now this was started to protect the oil industry in Canada. Now does anybody know what major company, you can hold it until the end. Uh, does anybody know the major company that so Imperial this is a very oil. popular company that we all still know and love here in Sarnia Lambton. Uh, so I'm going to see if anybody wants to chat, uh, drop a name in the chat. Uh, I know this company rather well. Uh, let's see if any of our friends joining us know the name of this company that was very influential in trying to keep Standard Oil out of the Canadian business and keep the Canadian oil fields in Canadian hands. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, see anybody responding. They used to have a mascot that was a tiger. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't think they're. Oh, let me see what's in the Q&A. Ron Nathan, yes. Oh. Um, and Sharon Lundy, yes. It's Imperial Oil and putting a tiger in your tank is the SO mascot. Uh, yes, yes, Imperial Oil and SO are one and the same. Yes, so yeah, Esso is still around and Imperial Oil is very much still around. And, you know, we want to go down the line of what is owned by who and all that. But yes, Esso, you fill up your cars, uh, you get your snacks for the road trips. Uh, so that is still around. Now, however, the gentleman uh, also on your screen there had something else to say about that uh, because he uh, decided to purchase Imperial Oil. Does anybody know who uh, the gentleman in the photo is? I wouldn't have known him by just looking at his photo. Uh, he's very influential, him and his family are very influential in the United States, not so much here in Canada compared to the United States. Yeah, so Sheila Ho Hewitt. Yes, it is Rockefeller. I believe that's J.D. Rockefeller. It is. Ten gold stars to you. Uh, he purchases it. Uh, and, you know, the greed of kind of keeping it closer to home. Uh, he moves the operations out of Petrolia. And unfortunately, the downturn uh, of the economy kind of follows with it. Um, but There were plenty of different, uh, yes, different corporations. Oh, don't, <laughs> definitely. It was not just one company, um, but we highlight Imperial Oil uh, because they have a, a big tie to us here as well as Devon and the Duke number one. Um, so kind of picked and choose what companies. Uh, if we, you want to hear more about the Dominion Oil Company, please visit us here in Oil Springs. We do have lots of information about them, along with the Canadian Oil Companies and White Rose. Yes, lots and lots of companies are formed uh, during this time. And it just doesn't stop there. It certainly doesn't stop uh, there. Now, you're kind of thinking, OK, Ontario, we have some in Ontario there. Uh, what else does Canada have? We got to be more than just lumber and nickel and, you know, mining. We're already mining into the earth. Maybe there's other resources like gas and petroleum and diamonds and who knows what's underneath us. So go west. We have a large country. The bigger photo uh, for you there. Um, more and more people are moving out westwards. Provinces start to be created. Uh, Alberta is not officially a province until 1905. Same thing with Saskatchewan. Uh, BC becomes a province uh, in uh, 1871, 1871. Manitoba, I call it the postage stamp Manitoba in 1870. It's not what we know of Manitoba today. And uh, essentially, there's that big gap in the middle between BC uh, and what becomes Ontario and tiny Manitoba. And that's where the railroad goes to connect C to C. That was uh, McDonald's vision. Uh, but it was also making sure that they could get people out there in case America tries to invade us for our resources. We can send soldiers and militia out there, which leads to the creation of the RCMP or what was known as the Northwest Mounted Police leads to the 1885 rebellion. 
Uh, and then something called the Klondike happens up north in the Yukon. People say, hey, there's gold up there. Well, let's go uh, mine some gold and become rich. Except a few people become rich, but lots of people get, uh, you know, stay in the West because it's easier. A lot of Americans try and come up and they don't realize how cold it is up in the Yukon. So that happens as well. Uh, but people start to stay in pockets, towns are created, and people see opportunity. Hmm, how can I make it? You know, everyone's finding their little niches and then they make money. How can I find a way to make our money? Well, at West here, we have plenty of stuff to do and see. And that comes into play here in 1901. Uh, a little bit after, quite a bit after oil springs and petrolia uh, out in Cameron Creek. So this is Southern Alberta, about Southwest, about 80 kilometers of Calgary, uh, probably like closer to hundred kilometers based on the roads, unless you're trekking diagonally straight down. Uh, we begin to drill in Cameron Creek. Uh, so we have John Lyman and George Lesser. Uh, they created the Rocky Mountain Development Company. It gets started. And as you can see there, the first well in Alberta or what becomes Alberta is created. Uh, not much to it, not compared to uh, oil springs and petroleum. We're very basic to start out. Uh, out in Cameron Creek, uh, but things fizzled out very, very quickly and the well went dry by 1904. So very quick turnaround, uh, but the ambition was there and it did not deter people from keeping looking and going out. And that's how we get to the first, I wanna say spark in Turner Valley. So here are some photos very barren wilderness uh doesn't get more barren than this and at the turn of uh the 1900s and the start of alberta outside of uh calgary and edmonton you're gonna get a lot of trees a lot of wilderness a lot of animals that might eat you so the danger in finding uh, resources you have to be vigilant at all times uh, there's no taking a break uh, many people were unfortunately lost to uh, bears and other animals uh, because it's a new food source for them. So why not? Uh, so a little bit of danger there. And then comes Turner Valley, located Southwest again of Calgary, a very important discovery for Alberta uh, and its claims uh, to enter into the energy sector in Canada. At this time as well, Alberta brand new uh, and just lots of I want to say a hope and a dream and that spark in the eye that Alberta will grow up and be a big strong province one day uh, when it has to compare itself to Quebec and Ontario, which kind of seems like what it does today. Uh, the, the big three that they call it. Uh, so uh, it wanted to be a player in uh, the Canadian energy and in Canada in general. Uh, so it looked to see how it could become that by using its natural resources, looking for oil, coal, and natural gas. Now, Southern Alberta is known for its natural grass, so much, in fact, that Medicine Hat is called the gas city, or as I like to call it, the gassy city, because uh, that's what I thought the sign said when I was driving through, and then it just was the gas city, but gassy city is more, uh, you know, catchy. Um, so in this turn, we have three waves, we'll call it, uh, for uh, the search for oil in Turner Valley. It all begins in 1911, when we have uh, businessman William Heron. Uh, he and other businessmen look for oil reserves uh, around the Sheep River area. So him and his uh, Calgary businessmen buddies, they start the Calgary Petroleum Production, or the CPP, not the Canadian uh, Pacific uh, rail or anything, but uh, the Canadian or the Calgary petroleum product. And by 1914, we bring in the Digman era. And this gets started by Digman one. It hits natural gas. Wow, we found gas. 
in overnight, 500 new oil companies were formed. Because back then you just needed a little bit of money to start your own corporation. So 500 new oil companies spring up very, very quickly. Now, I did say gas and not oil or petroleum. People, the real money at the time was petroleum, not natural gas, like it would be today uh, as people use natural gas to heat things. Uh, there wasn't a process to take that natural gas quite yet to the production that we have today, but they knew the petroleum, uh, that's what they were looking for. So by 1920, in the Digman era, we had nine successful wells uh, and a little bit of that excitement uh, had you know, died out, but they didn't stop. That leads us to the Royal Light era, 1924. Our friends, Imperial Oil, they're back. They purchased the CPP company and begin to explore the area again. Now, Royal Light 4, it finds a pocket of natural gas. They were ordered to stop. Now, I don't know if uh, they didn't want to go home, they didn't want to pack up, uh, or they didn't listen or didn't even hear the orders because they kept drilling, which at the time could be very, very dangerous. You hit the wrong pocket of gas, spark lights it up, you're 200 to 500 feet away from where you are, uh, potentially not even breathing anymore. But they kept drilling and underneath that pocket of natural gas, they found crude oil. Imagine that, very interesting, not known at the time that oil could be hidden underneath natural gas. And this led to another little, little boom, uh, but did not ignite the 500 new oil companies uh, like the Digman era did, but that's okay. As time progressed, more and more people wondered, hmm, could oil be even deeper than we thought it was? Could it be underneath natural gas pockets? Well, we get our third wave uh, and the Royal One strikes an oil reserve not seen before in Alberta. And that begins the Turner Valley boom. Now the Turner Valley boom, it reaches its uh, big peak by 1942. Now at this time, 1942, what is the world's pretty much preoccupied with. Excellent. Sharon has commented on uh, World War II. Uh, that has some significant impacts here on Sarnia Lambton and the development of the Polymer Corporation, um, which eventually becomes Polysar. Let's see what, uh, yes. And we have Brian once again saying the World War. So these things are very important in our Canadian history. They're very important because you have a, you need a fuel source to power that war machine. There's lots going on. There are fights in those traditional European markets. Uh, we have whole exhibits here on Galatia and what's going on in the Austro-Hungarian Empire with uh, the Canadians, uh, particularly William McGarvey um, and the works that he was doing in those oil fields. Uh, plus, you have the revolutions in Russia and the downfall of Ghazni, um, and then uh, the Turkish expeditions. Yeah, have... and, uh, as a historian, I could go on and on about uh, the need and the wants. And yeah, gas, petroleum, we need to be, you know, have our vehicles move, uh, produce production, uh, airplanes now, World War II, uh, bigger tanks. Uh, weapons. We all know what happens uh, in Japan. So all of this is important. And now more than ever, natural resources, establishing yourself to help win the war. Um, but of course, in many politicians' minds and strategists, kind of having that discovery for whenever the war ends, how are we going to recoup after the war efforts? Exactly. Lubricants for the war. So very important oil uh, plays a fact in lubricants, even today with hydraulic fluids and uh, production of uh, 
Oh, I have a list in my head of so many products to rely on it, plastics, uh, polymers, all of that. Significantly so, in the Sarnia Lambton area, we have the formation of the Polysar company to create synthetic rubber because just down the road is Detroit, Michigan, which is the American industrial hub, which needs synthetic rubber tires. Since the fall of Japan, uh, our Japan uh, collapsed Hong Kong, we no longer have allied access to the natural rubber fields, um, which means that now the allies need synthetic rubber. There are safe ports in Sarnia to provide that oil resource with the products coming out of Petrolia and Oil Springs with the industrial technology of Polysar to create synthetic rubber to feed the industrial hubs of the United States. Exactly. Which is yes. where it leads us <laughs> to Imperial Oil. Imperial Oil, our dear friends, Imperial Oil, uh, they come back and they help us. So Turner Valley uh, is a big hit, uh, but it's, you know, starts to drive the need for more oil. Uh, after this peak, uh, we and with World War II ranging on at the time, uh, Alberta looks to more. How do we find more? Well, there's nowhere further to go than up past Calgary and see what happens. That brings us to what is known as the Leduc era. It's not as glamorous as it sounds. Uh, the, you know, the further north they go, the more wilderness they have to worry about. You have the Rocky Mountains to the west, but then you also have the prairie lands to the east in Saskatchewan. So they're not quite sure what they're going to find because they believe uh, the farther away from the mountains they go because at a diagonal of the Rocky Mountains, it's only about an hour drive from Calgary, whereas here it takes about three hours to get to Jasper. So the higher up you go, the farther away you get from the Rocky Mountains. And, uh, you know, the further east you go, the closer to the prairies and the flatlands and the wheat. And they're thinking there's no way we're going to find huge deposits here. Uh, well, with the support of the federal government, the search for oil was on. So more money is injected. Our friends Imperial Oil uh, are back out here looking for those rich deposits. But they're striking out. So what they have to do is they have to search for wells. They need uh, geological surveys, uh, they need testing, and all of that costs money. So Imperial Oil is funding this, of course, with the help of the government, uh, but they keep on striking out and striking out and striking out and striking out and striking out. So why was Leduc called the last chance well? Well, we get to 1946. So we've gone a little bit more in, in time and we still haven't found anything significant, especially compared to Turner Valley. So it was starting to look dejected. The businessmen in Toronto at the headquarters of Imperial Oil at the time were thinking, ah, we gotta pull the plug. We're just flushing down money. We're not gonna survive in a decade or decade and a half if we, you know, don't find anything, we're going to have to look elsewhere and pool our money. But the geologists kept finding little clues, little hints that this, this could be big for us. Let's just keep going. And uh, it was around this area, well, exactly 200-ish meters from me that they tested. And they got a very positive seismic reading of what potentially could be underneath the earth. And they suggested that we, you know, dig a few uh, sample wells here and see what happens. And uh, it was at, well, it was up to, uh, turn my page here. It was uh, up to Vern Hunter. And this is where I'm going to. So we have oh. a, a panel, uh, our, a participant has raised their hand. Douglas, I think you raised your hand. So um, Douglas, if you want, you can put uh, a question in the Q&A or in the chat, and I'll be able to uh, fill, uh, share that with uh, Justin.
as he's moving around the galleries, which is so much as fun, a little dis disorienting. So Douglas, if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and we'd be happy to, to answer that or we can save it for the very end. I don't see a question right now, but so we'll carry on. So I am inside the gallery now and we are uh, entering kind of the farm field. So this area used to be a farm field. It was owned by Mike and Pearl Turda, which is a great name. This is their mailbox, although it's only Mike's name on the mailbox because it's 1946. Uh, but Vern Hunter was in charge of going to the farmers and knocking on their doors and getting kind of land deals to see if we are able to dig into the earth to hopefully find a well. Well, it was Mike and Pearl. They were sat down in their kitchen. Vern and his son uh, went and talked to them and they said, sure, because the upside was you're going to make about 12 and a half percent to 15 percent if any oil is found on the land in uh, rights. And then you get a little bit of money for surface rights just for drilling. So what the heck? If they find something, we get money. If they don't, we get a little bit of money. It's a win-win at the time. And what do they find here? Whew. Well, they find the richest deposits uh, ever found in Alberta for oil. And it was just something that they never had seen before. Now, after their tests, we get these guys rolling in. This is a skid shack. So when wells were being set up, individuals and families would roll in on these skid shacks, which are essentially houses that can be moved from place to place. You put them on skids and then they pick up very easily and go after that. So the skid shacks started to arrive here. Now, one question we get is why is this called Leduc number one? Well, at the time, the city of Leduc, which is roughly 25 kilometers from where we are located, or if you go diagonally, it's probably closer to 15, 16. That's the only major city that was set up. Now, at the time as well, we are roughly 30 kilometers from Edmonton, or at least it, you know, it takes me about 20, 22 minutes to drive to work. Uh, at the time, it was believed there's no way you will find oil or rich deposits close to a big city. So that's why they thought there's no way we're going to look around Edmonton. It just makes no sense because never have they found uh, oil or rich deposits by a city. So it's a waste of time. But it was the geologists and Vern who really pushed for the test to be done and for us to find that, you know, it didn't matter that we're so close to a major city. We were, we were right. So testing began and a well is set up. And because it was so promising the test, they thought we're going to make this a spectacle. So on the day of February 13th, 1947, we were going to open the well. Well, that's going to bring a huge audience. But like you guys are experiencing, and uh, we have experienced uh, quite a bit this winter, the ups and downs of winter, middle of February, when harsh conditions and cold temperatures can be the norm of the time but they set it for february 13th 1947 and as you can see by the giant blown up photo this is the view that awaited people on that very very cold day it was roughly minus 32 and it the well was supposed to open at 10 a.m but as they were swabbing the drill the day before 
it broke because it was so cold. So of course, 10 a.m. comes and goes and nothing happens because they're still repairing things. Imagine that, a cold temperature causes mechanical failure. I don't, uh, I don't think we've ever experienced that ever again. Uh, so the well does not come in until about 4 p.m. on February 13th. So just delayed a little bit by six hours, which isn't too bad, but people were standing around in the cold waiting for something to happen and nothing was happening. So by the time 4 p.m. rolls around, there's a very few cars in a crowd compared to 10 a.m. Uh, so not many people stayed to actually see Jim and the well come in, but it was still a things of the well being come in, played all across Canada on CBC uh, because it was, it was that promising at the time. Now they did not know how promising it would turn up to be, but it came to be. Now, why was Leduc so promising? Well, for that reason, we have to go back a little bit farther than pre-Confederate Canada, roughly 350 to 60 million years uh, ago, because we are now underwater. We are in the Devonian period. So this is what Alberta looks like underwater. Think of it as a prehistoric little mermaid. We have lots of prehistoric sea life. We have amnonites. We have petrified wood. We have sea creatures galore. Now, that is uh, partially how the Rocky Mountains are formed because we are a giant glacier uh, or we're Think of it as a giant lake with the mountains on one side and what eventually becomes the prairies was not so flat at this time. But, uh, you know, stuff happens and that's how we get Saskatchewan. So eventually over millions and millions of years, this ocean goes away and we get naturally rich uh, Western Canada and underneath us, oh, a few hundred thousand, or not a hundred thousand, a few thousand feet below the earth where I'm standing, we will find fossils and reefs like this. And uh, also, if you ever visit Alberta and you find a fossil uh, in fossil-rich Alberta, uh, unfortunately, you have to report all your findings to the government uh, because there's lots of people stealing, obviously, dinosaur bones uh, and other fossils. So uh, you potentially could keep a fossil you find here in Alberta, but you do have to fill out a form and they have to say, yes, it's okay to keep it or no, we take ownership of it. Uh, there was a story where a girl was walking her dog and she found, I think a woolly mammoth uh, bone about two weeks ago. And uh, so it's a big find and it's at the uh, Royal Alberta Museum. Uh, so fossils are still being found uh, even today so yeah, if you ever travel to Alberta looking for fossils, unfortunately you don't get to keep if you find any, or you know you might have to smuggle it out. But you didn't hear that from me, especially since this is going on the internet. Uh, so the reason why this area of Alberta is so rich in uh, fossil in petroleum findings is because of the Devonian Reef, and all of the materials that was happening created very rich pockets for them to find, which leads us to the popularity. Once the rich deposits are found, oh boy, the workers come and the companies come and the wells get put in. And just like in Turner Valley, just like in oil springs and Petrolia, many companies are formed, many people come looking for work uh, and everyone was looking to make it rich. But there's a little bit of a problem. The city of Leduc, which is very far away, uh, doesn't have all that many houses. There's a housing crisis in 1947, 48 uh, in the area. Edmonton's too far to go. The Duke is the closest place, but there's not enough places for people to live. So people were camping out in farm fields. They were building their own skid shacks just for a place to sleep. So Imperial decides, you know what? We're going to set up our own town.
Dustin, you're cutting out. So um, I don't know if you can reconnect, uh, but we can see your slides share, uh, but your audio is missing. My audio, I'm not even on Wi-Fi right now. That's very odd. Well, you are now back. So okay, I'm now me, back. All right. Back. So yeah, you know, the building's got a lot of metal, so there's little blips uh, here or there. So uh Devon the town of Devon is created so there's this very famous photo of the well coming in in uh February of 47 here are some few other photos I wanted to get a mixture of winter uh because it's very wintry right now in February this is another famous photo of the well coming in look at all that oil just being put on the ground no big deal now the town of Devon, so about two kilometers uh, north of where I'm standing, where the well site is, uh, they purchased land to create the town of Devon. Imperial Oil was trying to find ways for uh, people to live in Leduc uh, or uh, even closer by trying to buy farmland and no one was going to sell them. So they went to the government and they said, we would like to purchase this land over here. And they created the town of Devon. And over the years, uh, it became a metropolis for the people. They built schools, swimming pools, rec centers, a uh, community center, which is located just right next door uh, to the museum here, uh, although it's not being used as a community center, but it was the mainstay for the town where graduations happened, dances happened, uh, elections, social get togethers. And the town of Devon really became a close knit community uh, with as many amenities uh, as the families would need it. So here's a map of uh, Edmonton. And if you look to the south, you can't see me pointing, of course. So you see the ring road right there and you kind of follow the number two highway down. That's how you get to Calgary. You'll see Leduc along the highway. That's uh, also where our airport is. So if you ever fly into Edmonton, uh, it's a little bit of a jaunt to get into Edmonton from the airport. They put it very far out, uh, but that's also the new airport. Uh, the old one used to be right downtown, but it wasn't very big for big airplanes. But if you look off to the left, you'll see the tiny dot that says Devon. So that is where Devon is located right on the shores of the North Saskatchewan River, the same river that goes into Edmonton. So you could uh, essentially kayak or uh, canoe right into downtown Edmonton from Devon here. Very scenic today. Uh, today there's roughly 6,800 residents. Uh, there's a golf and country club. There's a, two schools. Uh, there's two grocery stores. It's a very small town feel, but that was, because of Imperial Oil and them having the forefront to know that this location is not going anywhere. There's so much oil. We're still pumping oil out today. Right behind in the back of the museum, there's a, there's a small refinery set up over there. To the right of the museum, there's a refinery over there. There are, let me see. You can see eight to 10 donkeys, if you don't know what a, donkey is, it's a pump jack, uh, but I always like to refer to them as donkeys. Uh, right from our parking lot and the drive up to the museum, you pass by countless others because when people come to Alberta, they expect to see those things. Um, and it's, it's a good sight when people visit the museum, they're like, oh, cool, I've never seen those. Look at them, oh, they're, they're moving, wow. So they get a kick out of that. Uh, so this area is still in production to this day, 76 years uh in into the future uh i don't know if they quite expected that but that's how rich uh this area is and how right they were to take a chance on the last chance well uh who knows what would have happened uh if we never did uh yeah so uh, in a second, I will sh uh, hopefully show you Leduc number one. Uh, it's getting a little dark, but uh, Leduc number one, the original uh, Derek, uh, was in production until the 1970s. 
uh, and then they retired it and it became a tourist attraction. So if you were coming up from Calgary or coming up from the airport, there was Gateway Park, which was like a big info center welcoming you to the city. And uh, you know, what's more welcoming than a giant derrick, what Edmonton is known for, an oil city. Uh, and it sat there. And even after the park closed, it sat there. And then it would put in storage until just recently, We'll go outside to the blistering cold, which is very nice sometimes when the sky is very nice. That Derek right there, and I wish I could zoom in, but I can't. That is the original Leduc number one. Now, like I said, the original location is just on the other side of that hut right there. Uh, now to, we do have lots of outdoor equipment, but it's a little hard to get to in the winter time. Uh, so they picked the new location right by Highway 60, the road, as a welcome uh, to the museum, and that is Leduc number one. And this is the model of Leduc number one as it was on opening opening day when it opened on February uh, 13th, 1947. So this is what the grounds look like minus the snow. And so it's kind of a nice model to when there's no glare on the window, uh, you can see the actual Leduc number one. Now, where do we go from here? That's a great question. Um, we're starting to look at different renewable energies. Uh, you know, we have solar, we talk about wind. Uh, depending on who you ask, who lives in Devon, some people, like I said, are a little bit afraid. Oh, oil's going away. They have that sense of comfort and it's their way of life. It's what started Devon. They don't want that history to go away. But it's not about going away. It's how do we integrate it in with other natural resources, stuff that potentially won't go away because eventually we, probably will run out of petroleum in the earth. So what do we do when we get to that point? Well, we have to have a plan. If it does happen, we're not gonna be like, oh, geez, what do we do now? Uh, I guess there's the sun, what do we do with the sun? So we have to be prepared and it's also gonna do better for our earth, uh, less land disruptions and uh, more bringing it back to uh, letting areas that aren't being uh, welled now, how do we get that back to natural resources so that it's safe for the animals, safe for us, and uh, it looks pretty, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so oil is not going anywhere. That's the question I get the most is, oh, you're it's being taken away again. I get it asked about at least once a week, so I have to iterate. It's how do we integrate it with the other resources that we have. Canada is so large and so bountiful in many natural resources. How do we integrate it into society, into our daily lives, so that we have a large array of different uh, resources to pick from? So we don't have to just pick from one and then it potentially goes away because we run out of it. We can pick and choose and do what's best for the different areas of Canada as well. Because what might be good, like hydro in Ontario, might not be good for out here in Alberta because we don't have as many lakes uh, as Ontario. So how do we use the kind of, uh, the strengths of the area, but then how do we share that with the rest of Canada in, uh, in producing energy and which will make Canada a better player in the future and in the world market, because that's where we're going is how do we compete worldwide with the energy resources we have? But again, the book is still not finished. It's not, uh, we're not even close to finishing writing the book on the energy future. Uh, so that's just a little bit of uh the past at least here in alberta and uh kind of how it connects to you out in oil springs in southern ontario
Yeah, well, there's a major connection is that there's a big giant pipeline, the Trans-Canada and Interprovincial Pipeline uh, brings thousands of barrels of oil in to feed the three major uh, petrochemical refineries and their subsidiaries, whether that's uh, Imperial Oil, which we were talking about today, uh, Suncor, or Shell Canada, uh, just down the road. We also have Enbridge operating the area along with Arlanxio and many others, including Nova. So we do have some questions in the Q&A and I encourage all of you, if you have questions for Justin or if you want a clarification between Oil Springs, which I seem to know a little bit about, or what's going on in Alberta or the hybrid chemistry clusters that are coming out or the hydrogen future, please feel free to put those in the chat. We'll be happy to work together to answer them. So we do have uh, a question already from Andy Hart. Uh, when did rotary drilling supersede the original uh, pound drilling? So he's looking for an answer um, in oil springs. In the early days, we used percussive drilling through either the Canadian pole drilling rig or a spring pole drilling rig, which was manually operated by humans uh, with their, um, their legs. So when do you have some, some information when they um, transfer from that? Because I'm assuming Turner Valley would have used Sorry, that's my stretch wear. Uh, percussive drilling towards rotary drill bits. Yeah, so uh, definitely the pounding drill. Um, it all depended too on the uh, type of uh, environment that you encountered. So in Ontario, the big darn thing, the Canadian Shield, uh, you know, that big rock gets in the way of uh, drilling very much. Uh, out here, we don't, outside of the Rocky Mountains, it's not as rough, uh, but we do uh, get into limestone and other hard stones out here as well. So uh, the exact year, I'm not 100% sure, uh, which I'm you know shaking my head at that I don't have an exact year on when rotary drilling was uh, brought in. Uh, but I think as resources as well, uh, you know, depending on uh, resources, manufacturing, the wars as well. Um, once World War II, there was pretty much all rotary drilling uh, out here uh, because resources weren't and metals weren't having to be kept for war times. Uh, and as more and more patrolling was found, such as in Turner Valley, it allowed for uh, bigger production. And at this time, when Leduc number one came into uh, production and was producing so much uh, petroleum places like the UK were still having a gas shortage and they were having to go back to wartime rations. So that just showed you the importance of what Leduc number one had on the area. And really at the time, there were more people living in Saskatchewan than they were in Alberta. And so when I say Leduc number one brought in people, it completely switched where people were moving to looking for work uh, it, I don't want to say decimated the population, but it, it was a, a big percentage of people would move from Saskatchewan to Alberta looking for work, whether in the energy sector, whether uh, just other jobs, because money was being poured into this one e uh, economic boom and uh, natural resource boom uh, in Western Canada. Uh, you had people from BC as well. You had manufacturers for uh, vehicles, for uh, products. Uh, everything was coming here and everyone was trying to make a buck uh, with uh, the find here. So it really transformed Alberta uh, up until the first uh, oil uh, downturn in the 70s. Uh, it really allowed Alberta to grow uh, economy wise, population wise, uh, and really have a voice in uh, Canada, uh, something that they felt they were lacking uh, from their conception. So we have another question. Uh, Alan Phillips asked, did any of the Ontario hard oilers move west to drill in Alberta in the early days? Uh, we do here at the Oil Museum know that hard oilers did go west. Uh, they, we do have a lot of them doing re uh, research reconnaissance, particularly in the late 1800s. A lot of them thought Alberta was a bust uh, outside of Turner Valley. They did go to Saskatchewan and there was prospecting in the 1870s. Um, in Saskatchewan from the Ontario Hard Oilers. Um, and I do know that even today, 
uh, you can't drive through Sarnia Lambton without running into Alberta plates uh, because the uh, the connections between Sarnia and Edmonton are so and Calgary are so close. Um, but I'm going to toss this over to Justin to see. Do you have any information on the Ontario Hard Oilers, the nickname for um, the the people of Oil Springs and Petrolia? Did they go west to Alberta in the early days? Uh, well, kind of like you were saying, uh, they did go west, but you were very correct. They just saw a barren land that was Alberta, and they thought it was a waste of time. Um, the reason why Saskatchewan had a bigger population was because they had found pockets uh, or they had uh, found uh, and people stayed in Saskatchewan to work. Uh, farming was becoming a big industry in Saskatchewan. And depending on where you are in Alberta, not so much. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Saskatchewan was seen as the up and coming promise, whereas Alberta was, this is, if you like hiking, there you go, roughing it, the place to be. Um, and yeah, it wasn't really until Turner Valley that people took it seriously as a, oh, maybe. And that's why I say it was a spark and not a boom, uh, even though they do say Turner Valley was a boom. Uh, and it very much was, but compared to what came after, it was the spark that got people interested and uh, intrigued in the area, Alberta, uh, and wanting to find more. But it was natural gas because it was Southern Alberta. And so uh, you got into the natural gas business, you were down there. And Calgary became kind of, and is still is today, is where a lot of headquarters are. Uh, a lot of the, if you will, the business side of things gets dealt in Calgary. A lot of uh, offices are down there. Whereas here in Edmonton, it's, uh, we, there are refineries right inside uh, Edmonton, uh, if you will, inside that ring road, if you look at a map on Edmonton. Uh, so it's seen as the uh, blue collar city compared to the uh, business white collar of Calgary. So there's that little rivalry that uh, became uh, to be because uh, the blue collar people said, we, we handle our business out here. You just sit in an office uh, down two hours away. So it's just like, uh, you know, Ottawa and Montreal rivalry or Toronto and Montreal rivalry. Uh, so you get that feeling and here, of course, sports play into it. They named the Edmonton Oilers because of the impact oil had on the city and surrounding area. So uh, definitely uh, I will see uh, Ontario plates being driven around, a lot of BC plates and some Saskatchewan plates as well um, uh, being out here. So it's still, uh, there are still people, you get a lot of, people that go up to Fort McMurray. We didn't even touch on uh, the Fort McMurray and the oil sands. Uh, but a lot of people from all over Canada that come and uh, they kind of Edmonton is the home base because it's the closest major city. And some people just kind of stay here instead of flying home uh, for a week uh, here and there. The travel gets to become a lot. Uh, people stop working in the field, if you will, and then go into kind of more sedentary production styles. They move up the ranks, they work in the, uh, in the refineries themselves. Uh, they kind of do safety, they get into, there's so much where you can go into the field. And I feel like at the time there was that little bit of trade-off, people would go to uh, Lambton County uh, there or they come to Edmonton and then kind of trade and take what they've learned and apply it to uh, their areas. Uh, I, I want to say it's probably still happens even today. Uh, it it still does. Paid. There are many individuals, some of them I believe are in this meet that are uh, travel back and forth between uh, Alberta and Ontario as we see a lot of the safety training. We have headquarters, we have administrators, we also have like I said, the interprovincial pipeline and three major petrochemical refineries, three oil refineries. Um, plus, we are dealing with uh, plastics and chemicals, and we are moving towards a hybrid chemistry cluster as well as a hydrogen fuel economy. Since the mm, refining yes. of petrochemicals often produces huge abundant uh, hydrogen resources. Um, Plus, we also have connections to most of the industrial hub in the United States. 
whether that be through the tunnels, the rails, the waters, or the airs. Yes, that's the next big thing. And I think something that maybe 10 to 15 years ago, uh, we wouldn't really be talking seriously. It was kind of a concept is that hydrogen fuel, what does that look like? Uh, there are new, uh, refinery uh, being made in Regina and Edmonton uh, and Enbridge, I believe is uh, adding on to their refinery here. And that uh, sole uh, add on will just be hydrogen based. And so it's uh, that's really the next chapter that's being written really, really fast and quickly uh, into what, you know, what does hydrogen fuel look like? Is that what our cars are going to be? Uh, is that going to be the competitor versus electric cars? Uh, will it do better because electric cars don't go very far without recharging and all that struggle? Uh, you're seeing cruise ships being um, transformed into uh, hydrogen based cruise ships which uh, will help fuel supplies and uh, you know less waste I don't want to say waste of fuel but the amount of people that go on cruises like myself uh, that enjoy it it's becoming very popular so they're looking for ways to use less fuel hydrogen is becoming that so uh, what you know airplanes maybe it's the next thing that we're looking at who knows so, uh, but we do have another question from our, our, our participants today. We have Eugene Costa. I know him rather well. Uh, we do have a statue of him here at the Oil Museum of Canada in one of our buildings. He is the father of natural gas in Canada, and he moves from the gas fields of Ontario, which was the second oil springs boom, which was the natural gas boom, to drill for gas in southern Alberta around Bow Island and formed the Canadian Western Natural Gas in 1912. Uh, Costa, interestingly, uh, his natural gas well is just down the road on Fairbank Oil Properties. Um, that was that natural gas gusher, but he was also heavily involved in natural gas production in Essex County as well, as there is lots of natural gas pockets in southwestern Ontario um, and was uh, key in helping to form Union Gas, which today is now Enbridge. Um, but he did form uh, the Canadian Western Natural Gas Company in 1912. Yeah, and so you see that definitely. Um, I, I want to say everything that happened in Ontario, uh, Alberta benefited from. Uh, without oil spins, petroleum, without the constant uh, findings and upgrading, I want to say things happen in Ontario and they kind of refine them, if you will, as a joke. Uh, and then they get implemented out here in uh, Alberta and it's kind of a trade-off now, something might happen here and then, then it gets implemented elsewhere. Uh, so there's a huge connection, there's a huge uh, tether uh, between uh, Lambton County, that area and Alberta as a whole, whether it's natural gas, petroleum, uh, bitumen, the oil sands, uh, a lot of the history, a lot of what has taken place in the two areas are very, very similar. And even growing up in Ottawa, it wasn't really talked about. Uh, it wasn't until I moved out here that I saw the huge connection. Um, so I think that's something that needs to be uh, kind of talked about more outside of, uh, you know, Southern Ontario, the rest of Canada, is that there, maybe the rivalry between Ontario and Alberta is so fierce because we're so much alike and uh well here i'm gonna struggle. make a proposal so justin i'm making a proposal right now that we end the feud and as far as oil museum to energy museum that we should celebrate and work together and create a pipeline of knowledge so that this pipeline of knowledge so that we can share the resources with the rest of canada so we can be proud of our industrial heritage, the difficult lessons that are learned and the future opportunities that these resources that connect the country past, present and future towards what will be, what we ever we hope to be a greener, greater enriching future. I, I am all for that. Uh, I am, Regardless, I am always up for collaboration and all of that. That's how people learn best. There's no you know, reason for butting heads for no reason. And we'll connect so the I'm pipeline. We're going to connect the pipeline. We're going to share it with our friends out east, our friends out west, and everybody north. 
and even the friends south of the border, because we do talk to our friends at the Drake Well in Pennsylvania, and we do have friends at Spindletop in Texas, uh, who was 1901 when they got their gusher at Spindletop. So it is coming to the end of our talk, friends. So I want to take a few moments to thank Justin. Um, and Brian is correct in the comments. Knowledge not shared is energy wasted. And we do not waste energy either at the oil museum or at the Canadian Energy Museum. So I want to thank Justin for being our guest speaker tonight and presenting an interesting talk. So thank you for everybody that attended tonight. Um, your support is critical in allowing us to preserve and share local history with all of our people and our friends. I want you to invite you to like and follow both museums on their social media channels. And I just wanna let you know, we have another talk coming up in May. This time we're talking with Craig Leith Heritage Depot uh, out in Collingwood about the first Canadian shale oil works that they were fracking the shales in Collingwood uh, to extract coal oil, which they then refined into kerosene. Um, in the 1850s and 1860s. So we're going to go back a little bit further to see where did this come from and what is the history around fracking and shale deposits and shale oils. We hear a lot about it in the news, but we're going to look intently at the Canadian heritage and Ontario aspects of this modern industry. So thank you all. Be free to check us all out. Um, and we will see you in the future, I hope. So I'm gonna stop recording, friends. <laughs>